Together Exploring Stories of Success. Uh, and this came out of the ACE Women's Regional Network. And I have a special thanks to our presidential sponsor, Dr. Haynes, and to our regional coordinator, Sarah Villarreal. Um, so we put our heads together a few years back and thought, what can we do to get the women of our campus together and talking about issues of, of common interest and importance to us as women in higher ed? Come on in. We just started. <laughs> welcome, welcome. And so uh, it is uh, in honor of Women's History Month, and as I mentioned earlier, sort of cathartic. Um, when I was thinking about the spring topic for the test talk, um, I, I was processing what had happened after the election and wondering why, why? And um, there was a November 14th Newsweek article and the title really hit home for me and it was, the presidential election was a referendum on gender and women lost. And then I, I kept thinking, why is that? And I felt, I, that so disheartened and demoralized the day after and I thought so a woman really can't be president that glass ceiling is is never going to be shattered and and then a couple of months passed and Elizabeth Warren was told to sit down and shut up and basically and I thought would that have happened if a man uh, were in her place and in fact it did Ted Cruz called Mitch McConnell a liar but somehow that was okay then I thought, well, would Bernie have won the election? It, why, why is this happening? And so came to uh, one of the Chavs events after the election, I heard Steve speak, and I thought, that would be a great, a great speaker for us uh, to come and, and ask us questions and give us things to think about and, and provide some answers for us. And so he is the first man ever to be invited. <laughs> <laughs> As you all know, as a professor of political science, he's been on campus since 1995. He was, you may not know, the founder of our kinesiology department on campus. He was also director of athletics, and so he's, and he was associate dean in what was formerly the College of Arts and Sciences. So Steve has served a number of roles on our campus uh, and has a very interesting research interests that dovetail very nicely with what we're going to talk about today. So. Um, I will turn it over to him in just a moment, but before I do, I just wanted to make sure that all of you saw President Haynes' message about tomorrow and A Day Without Women, um, uh, the, the global initiative. So if you could wear red tomorrow, if you are so inclined, and if you'd like to participate in taking a photo, we're going to meet uh, at Craven, uh, the Craven Circle Steps at 9.30 um, for a photograph. So all of you who were part of Pantsuit Nation, <laughs> uh, in red uh, at 9.30. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Steve. Thank you. So you want answers, huh? <laughs> I think this is where I would normally thank Regina for the nice introduction, tell you how happy I am to be here. I am scared to death of you. <laughs> You're the first man to speak to this, and I'm, and I'm here to talk to you about gender and politics. So I'm here to tell you, hey, guess what? The fact that Hillary Clinton's a woman might have had something to do with the 2016 election outcome. I have a PhD in political science, so I can say that kind of thing. This has mansplaining written all over it. And I'm really nervous. Um, so I'm going to try not to do that. Um, but I have to be honest, uh, my credentials as far as having no idea what I'm talking about go way back <laughs> uh, to my birth as a, a male, actually, a white male nonetheless. Um, in, uh, in 2002, here's a little anecdote to underscore what I don't know about this topic, and you should be really glad that I'm here to talk to you about it. Um, I did a paper with Stacey Beavers, my colleague in political science. I actually wondered if she would be here today because she could corroborate this story. And we were looking at uh, whether or not the American public was ready for an unconventional president, by which we meant anything other than a white, male, Protestant, heterosexual president. And so we did a survey, and the key question in the survey was, um, if your party nominated a well-qualified blank, would you vote for that person? And the blank was woman, African-American, Hispanic, uh, atheist, gay or lesbian. 
And we found about what you'd expect. Large majorities of our samples said, yes, I would vote for a woman. Yes, I'd vote for an African American. Uh, majorities, but smaller majorities, said they would vote for a Hispanic. Um, almost no one said they were going to vote for an atheist or a, a gay or lesbian person. So if you're a, a, a gay, atheist, black female, um, you have no shot. <laughs> just, just get that out there. Um, but the other question that we asked was, it was a follow-up question, we wanted to see whether members of those groups themselves, how they felt about the prospects of one of their own winning the presidency. Uh, so I remember when we got the data back, literally we just crunched the numbers and, and we were looking at the results, and I, I'm sitting with Stacy, and, and, I, and I saw that women were decidedly more pessimistic than men were about the prospects of a woman winning the presidency. And I said, Stacy, I'm surprised about this. I would have thought that women would be empowered, and you go girl, and all gung ho, and yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Stacy's a very nice colleague, and she, she didn't call me an idiot. Um, her look kind of did a little bit. Uh, uh, and all she said was, yeah, I'm not surprised. And there was an undertone in that comment of, you've never experienced a glass ceiling, have you? No, I haven't. Nor a color barrier, for that matter. Uh, so that's what I know about this topic. Um, the thing is, though, 2016 seemed like it was going to be the time. It was the year. Uh, did we break the glass ceiling? It, it, it could have been 2008. It would have been 2008 had Hillary gotten the nomination. Uh, there's no doubt in any reasonable person's mind that whoever the Democratic Party nominated in 08 was going to win the presidency. Uh, George W. Bush was leaving office with record low approval ratings. It was the Great Recession. The economy was in the tank. We were fighting two unpopular wars. Whomever won the nomination for the Democratic Party was going to be president. And it could have been Hillary. It might well have been Hillary, but she ran up against the force of nature and electoral politics known as Barack Obama. So she didn't win. She left. Uh, uh, she didn't go away and sulk and hide. She actually served in the Obama administration as Secretary of State. Uh, she was the one person in the Obama administration that the Republican Party and its media division, also known as Fox News, uh, <laughs> pointed to before she became the presumptive nominee of the party. She was the one person in the Obama administration that they pointed to as the person they respected in the administration. That they actually liked her. Um, so it just seemed that 2016 was the year when this was all finally gonna, gonna happen and Hillary was gonna win the nomination. We can talk a lot about the fight that she got from Bernie and whether Bernie would have won had he been uh, nominated in 2016, but Hillary was the presumptive nominee and the Republican Party gave her what I thought at the time was a tremendous gift. <laughs> this guy. Um, I, I would say he's clearly the most blatantly uh, sexist, misogynistic, major party nominee in, his, in modern history. And I only put the qualifier modern history because I have no idea whether Rutherford B. Hayes or Calvin Coolidge was more sexist. Jill's, Jill's uh, is saying yes. Probably during the era that they were in. Know. I mean, given the era they were in, probably. But in the modern era, nobody, no major party nominee comes close to Trump. And so, if you think about it, uh, a, a majority of the voting public is female today. Women comprise about 52 to 53 percent of the electorate. So you've got a, a predominantly, not by a lot, but predominantly female electorate. You've got a woman, a female nominee for the first time in the history of a major party running against a completely sexist uh, Republican for the uh, uh, other party. Clearly, this is going to be a landslide. And in fact, there were a lot of pre-election analyses and expert predictions that suggested that uh, Hillary was going to win the women's vote by historic margins. First, there would be a, a historic surge of uh, women voters in the electorate, and that she was going to win among them by such margins that that alone would be enough to, to, make, to, to, to win the presidency. It was really a matter of whether it would be just a normal win or a huge win, a landslide win. And the slide that you see uh, here before you here is data, um, I think this is from 538.com, but it's, it's showing the advantage that Hillary had over Trump among women voters. And it's the biggest since 1972. Apparently women weren't big fans of Richard Nixon either. Um, so with all that in mind, of course there's no way in the world that she could possibly lose this election. Oh, yes there is. I had the great misfortune of coming to campus on election night um, for the, what was supposed to be an election night watch party, uh, and 90% at least of the people there, especially the young women there, were coming uh, to celebrate the election of the first female president, and it clearly didn't go that way. And so I found myself trying to explain, with no explanation that I could, because I didn't expect it, I didn't predict this, I didn't, I didn't see this coming at all. Um, there were several states that Hillary had to win. Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania is known as the Blue Wall. Obama won both those, all those states in 08 and 2012. 
And she was leading in those states in almost every poll going up to the election. And with any two of those states, especially if Ohio was one of the two, there's almost no mathematical path to 270 for Trump. And so she just had to win a couple of them. And, and she was expected to win all four. And I would throw in Florida as well. Like, you need me to point to Florida on the map to know where it is. Um, because it's in the same thing. And also, a, a thing to note about those four states, and, and five if you had Florida, um, the margin of victory in those states was about a percentage point between Clinton and Trump. A percentage point switch in those states, two of the five, especially if it's Ohio and Florida, would have been a different outcome. Um, but she lost all five. And I think it's worth taking a little bit of a, a look into the data about how things went uh, nationally and in those five states to kind of get some sense of, of why she lost. First off, the expected surge of women in the electorate never happened. In fact, women comprised a slightly smaller, just a percentage point, but, but a slightly smaller proportion of the electorate in 2016 than they had in 2012. Um, so there was no surge. And secondly, she didn't do appreciably better among those women who did turn out to vote. Uh, she, received, she beat Trump by 12 percentage points in 2016. Obama beat Romney by 11 percentage points among women in 2012. So no huge surge, no overwhelming uh, of, uh, split in favor of Hillary. And then if you, if you look at the, the blue wall states plus Florida that I mentioned before, you see pretty much the same thing. Uh, women comprising about the same proportion of electorate uh, in those states as they did nationally, which you would expect. What's interesting to me is the, is the percentages by which Hillary beat Trump in those states. In some of them, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, she won by healthy margins. But in Florida and Ohio, the two most important, the two most electoral vote rich states of the five, um, she won by four and three percentage points, respectively. And the Ohio margin is especially troubling, A, because I went to Ohio State, so I'm disappointed <laughs> in my, my adopted home state. But she only received 49% of the vote in Ohio, among women. Not, not overall, just women. Uh, she, that 3% represents a, a 49 to 46% Hillary win among women in the state of Ohio. Um, another way to look at this data, to slice and dice things, is to look at what I call crossover voting, um, which you might think of as rating, the ability of a candidate to, to get votes from the other side where you wouldn't expect them to find any votes. So Hillary's ability to get votes from Republican men, and to me, even more surprising, Trump's ability to get votes from people from women who identify as Democrats. I'd love to talk to one of these people to find out what they were thinking. Um, you'll notice that apart from Florida, where Hillary did a little bit better at this kind of rating than Trump did, in the blue wall states, Trump was more successful at snatching these votes away from unexpected places than Hillary was. And given how close the election was in these states, that kind of thing right there is enough to have switched the outcome. And to me, this is, this is stunning data, that Trump was that successful. And this, is, by the way, is all according to CNN exit poll data. So um, there have been a number of explanations offered for how Trump pulled this off. Um, here's a few of them. Economic dislocation, the, the notion that we are, that many people, especially in red state America, especially in small town rural America, are feeling the effects of job loss to uh, automation, to jobs taken overseas and there's anxiety about that. Um, there's a lot of good research. There's a sociologist whose name I'm forgetting. She's at Berkeley, and she spent five years uh, in red state America talking to people and trying to understand the perspective. And what she came away with was the, the overwhelming conclusion was that um, people in those states feel the federal government is completely out of touch with their problems. And when you say federal government, you might also say Democratic Party, because the Democratic Party that, that, that poses the federal government as a solution to people's problems. So really, that, that's the part of that, that perception hurts the most. Um, there's been a lot of interesting research that links authoritarianism in individuals to support for Trump. Uh, there's a, a really interesting uh, battery of questions about parenting style. And it involves whether you think kids should uh, speak when they're spoken to, and otherwise, you know, be out of, or whether you think kids should be creative and, and express themselves. And people who score high on the authoritarianism index that's correlated with uh, support for Trump. Um, it's not too surprising that racism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, and all of that is linked to support for Trump. Um, and then there's the, the weaknesses that Hillary had as a candidate herself. Right? Well, she, was, she was, in some ways, a flawed candidate. Um, you know, the email scandal, the hacking and all of that, uh, and, and the fact that she was actively under investigation by the FBI, that didn't help. She's not an especially gifted campaigner. I happen to think she would have been a very effective president, but the, unfortunately, the, the skill set needed to get the job is different than what was needed to do the job. And so she never, you know, never got the chance. Um, 
maybe the, the, the thing that is, was her biggest flaw is hardly, her, it's hardly any fault of hers. Um, you know, she, she has this impressive resume as a byproduct of having been in Washington since 1992. Uh, as First Lady, as Senator from the State of New York, as Secretary of State. But as a byproduct of that, she also is about as establishment a candidate as you could possibly be in what many people at the time said, and certainly in retrospect, it turned out to be a change election. So uh, there's nothing she could have done about that. You know, she was the nominee partly because it was her turn, um, but that very fact kind of worked against her when voted her for something. I had the sense that many voters just wanted to take a brick and throw it through the front window of Washington, D.C. and just shake things up. And Trump was the only changed candidate in the race. And Hillary certainly wasn't. So there's all that, and, and we, you know, you can, in an election this close, you can you can slice and dice in any number of ways and say that was the issue and that was the issue. And any one of them could have could have tipped the balance. But of course, I'm here to talk about one other issue that had something to do with this, and clearly sexism did. Clearly, her gender played a role in all of this. Um, and as usual on this topic, my thinking on the subject was completely backwards, completely wrong. I came to it from a point of view of, well, when, when the Access Hollywood uh, tape came out and all of that happened, I remember messaging friends saying, well, as if he had any chance to begin with, he certainly has no chance now. No. Not only did it not cost him the election, it actually helped him win the election. Um, and so I want to talk about three types of sexism, uh, two of which are pretty well established in the social psychological literature, and one of which I'm kind of making up, but I'll make a case for it and you can you know better than I do what if I'm, if I'm on board here. Let's, let's talk first about hostile sexism. You didn't have to go far to find that in the election. Um, this, by the way, this van is from a, it was parked at a Clinton rally. This was not at a Trump rally. These good old boys thought it'd be a good idea to drive this thing to, to, you know, to Hillary's rallies. Um, clearly people with those kinds of viewpoints and attitudes are not going to support Hillary Clinton. Uh, you didn't have to just find it among, among Trump supporters, though. You could also find it in the right-wing news media, I'm going to show you just a, a little bit of a clip to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that were being said on many of these news outlets. Uh, some are on the, f on the far right-wing fringe, others are not. Others are Fox News and the um, token uh, conservative commentator on places like MSNBC. So hopefully this will work and hopefully the volume is okay. Here's the thing, I'm not being sexist. She's called the B-word because she acts like one. She's a stereotypical Bitch. Oh, these call her a vaginal American, I suppose. Is just, that the new friend? I think yeah, she's trying to run away from this uh, tough, uh, kind of bitchy image. Maybe they're too emotional, or maybe they're bitchy sometimes. Don't vote for her, but you're not allowed to say that. We need to try, convict, and shoot Hillary Clinton in the vagina. No, personally, I, I would cast Philip <laughs> Seymour Hoffman to play uh, Hillary no. Clinton. And if Hillary Clinton becomes president in 2016, she will not only be our first female president, she could be our first lesbian. President. I've met her in a bar room in Memphis. I can't, now I can only think of Hillary Clinton. You talk women, crooked Hillary, pole dancing, Bernie Sanders supporters throwing dollar bills at her with hot sauce in the purse for the poll. No, no, I think Hillary has, you know, feels a little insecure because she's a female running to be the commander in chief. Get a woman in the Oval Office, most powerful person in the world. What's the downside? You mean besides the PMS and the mood swing? You better not be start playing your vagina card, but she's playing that card. And when Hillary Clinton speaks, men hear, take out the garbage. But when she raises her voice, and when a lot of women do, you know, it, as, as I say, it's, it reaches a point where every husband you know in America is heard at one time or another. When she reacts the way she reacts to Obama, with just the look, the look toward him, looking like everyone's first wife standing outside the program court. I don't think she would have had any political job ever were it not for her husband. Nobody has ever, ever benefited more from sexual favors she herself did not dispense than Hillary Clinton. <laughs> if she hadn't married the guy... I... Nothing to add to that. I mean, obviously... Well, I mean, maybe there is something to add. Um, if, if a male had been the Democratic nominee, many of those same sources, those same reporters, would have had very negative things to say about that person. But would they have been as gendered and as sexualized as that? There's no way. It goes without saying. Uh, so clearly, you know, with those views out there and people holding those views, those are, those are not going to be Clinton supporters. Um, so I call that hostile, well, I, I don't call it, that is hostile sexism. The next thing I want to talk about is the one I'm making up, and I'm calling it symbolic sexism. And I'm, I'm borrowing a phrase from the literature of political science, that, uh, from the literature that looks at racism. Uh, there's a line of research that argues that 
Um, in, in society today, many people understand that, that expressing overtly or blatantly racist viewpoints is just not acceptable anymore. So well, racism actually hides behind support for things like traditional values. So a person might say, oh, I, I don't oppose welfare programs because I'm racist. Oh, no, I have many black friends. I oppose welfare reform because it breeds a dependency, and people need to pick themselves up from their bootstraps, and that's what it is. The other problem is that a lot of interesting experimental research in political science will do things like, uh, we'll set up an experiment where we'll read a scenario involving a hypothetical uh, person uh, who's maybe asking to, for welfare, so some sort of aid from a government program. You know, we'll say this person uh, lost, lost her job and, and fell on a hard time. Should she get assistance from the government? And when we describe the person in question in the experiment as white, as opposed to black, they get a lot more uh, assistance. Well, the response is much more willing to help them out. So clearly there's a racist element in this. And I think there's some of that going on in sexism today. And this might be one of those moments where you say, no kidding, idiot, of course there is. <laughs> but you know, I mean, apart from the blatant and the hostile stuff we just looked at, I think there's a lot of people who would, who would deny being sexist and yet would say things like, well, I just, I, I'm not comfortable with a woman being president, or is there something about a female president that just broke me the wrong way? It's perfectly fine for a woman to be the Secretary of Education, for a woman to be the Secretary of Health and Human Services, because those are, are women's domains. That's acceptable. But Secretary of Defense? Mm, not so much. President and Commander-in-Chief? No, that, that can't happen. And so I think, and going back with some more data, I don't know how well you can see that, uh, this is from a Gallup and it was taken two years before the election, this was in uh, 2014. And the question being asked was, what is the worst or most negative thing about a Hillary Clinton presidency? And this is not all the responses, these are just the responses that mentioned something having to do with her personal characteristics, her personal attributes. So there are a lot of other responses that mentioned things like, you know, policy issues, and you know, I don't like, I don't like Democrats, those kinds of things. But these are the ones that got to characteristics of Hillary as a person. And what I'm amazed by you know, are, is the first three. Numbers two and three, to me, are, are getting right at that hostile, blatant sexism. I just don't want a woman as president. That, that's pretty blatantly sexist. And I, I would put number three, that she got elected in the first place, is maybe in that same category. Now, I can't read the minds of the people who are saying these things, but I, I'm, just, I'm just sensing that that's is probably what's going on. But number one is this truly stunning one to me. Well, she's not qualified. By what measure is she not qualified? <laughs> You could make a more reasonable argument that she may be the most qualified person who's ever run. You put that resume underneath a male's name, and the qualification question is never even asked. And yet, it's the number one most commonly mentioned personal characteristic of why people thought that she might not be a good president, some sort of lack of qualifications. And whether it's the blatant sexism or the more hostile version, I think that is what Trump tapped into quite well when he said things like, she doesn't have the look. This is a clip from the, I think it was the third debate, it could have been the second debate. Um, and he, so on the campaign trail, Trump said more than once, uh, she just doesn't have, a, she doesn't have a presidential look. So he was asked about that in the debate. Uh, this year, Secretary Clinton became the first woman nominated for president by a major party. Earlier this month, you said she doesn't have, quote, a presidential look. She's standing here uh, right now. What did you mean by that? Uh, she doesn't have the look, she doesn't have the stamina. I said she doesn't have the stamina. And I don't believe she does have the stamina. To be president of this country, you need tremendous stamina. The court was you have, wait, wait, wait a minute, minute she asked court. me a question. Did you ask me a question? You have to be able to negotiate our trade deals. You have to be able to negotiate, that's right, with Japan, with um, so he tried to pivot from look to stamina. He said look, as if stamina is somehow any better, any less sexist. She doesn't have the presidential look if you mean that no president has ever looked like that. That's true. Um, but, but he, I think, sensed the incorrectness of saying that, so he tried to make it something about lacking some kind of stamina, as if there is something about doing the job as, as, of president that requires some, sort of, some form of stamina that women don't have, and oh, only yes, fine specimens like this. That's a cheap shot, I apologize. <laughs> I debated whether to even go there, and I put it in last minute. Um, you know, Michelle Obama said, when they go low, we go high. I just want to go 
I don't necessarily feel good about that, but it makes the point, though. How can he question her stamina and her physical, literal, literal physical fitness for office, and he looks like that, and it doesn't matter? I mean, there's nothing about, what, what, what exactly is the male advantage in terms of physical strength? Is it just upper body strength? Um, there's nothing about the presidency that involves doing pull-ups. <laughs> Hopefully, thankfully, because he can't do it either. Um, and I got to thinking, what if Barack, or what if John McCain had said anything remotely along those lines about Barack Obama in 2008? What if he got on the debate floor and said, he doesn't have a presidential look? The, the, uh, the only thing about Obama that didn't look presidential compared to previous presidents was the skin color, and the obvious racist backlash that would have resulted from that would have ended McCain's candidacy at that moment. And yet somehow, Trump is able to say the functionally equivalent thing about Hillary and her gender, nothing happens. So getting directly to the question of sexism and the 2016 vote, um, this is from a, a political scientist named Brian Schaffner, who's at the University of Massachusetts. And he studies exactly this question. And what he's showing here in this slide is the impact of sexism on the vote. And he's comparing 2012 to 2016. And he measures sexism in a survey with a battery of questions. He asks four simple questions. And they're, and they're, they're statements, really. And the respondent is asked to agree or disagree with the statement. And the statements are, Many women are actually seeking special favors, such as hiring policies that favor them over men under the guise of asking for equality. Women are too easily offended. Women seek to gain power by getting control over men. When women lose to men in a fair competition, they typically complain about being discriminated against. So a person who said, oh, I agree with those four statements, the, the more you agree, the more sexist you are. Uh, and so you'd be on that end of the scale. And the person who said, I disagree, would be the least sexist. And the green line is for 2012. And you see there that the most sexist people had a higher probability of voting for Romney than the least sexist, but not by very much. It's around a 0.5 probability. Oh, and by the way, for you stats geeks out there, this is after uh, that little fine print right there says that's after controlling statistically on ideology, party, authoritarianism, gender, and age. So this is the relationship once that is all held uh, constant statistically. But then you look at the orange line, and that is 2016. The least sexists had a low probability of voting for Trump, and the most sexists had twice the likelihood of voting for Trump. Clearly, sexism played a much larger role in 2016 than it has in recent elections. Not too shocking, but, but at least there's data to, to support the same idea. Um, last but not least, I want to talk about this notion of benevolent sexism. And I'm, I'm taking this from the work of people like Susan Fisk, who's at Princeton, I believe. She's a social psychologist. Um, she actually wrote the textbook, Social Cognition, that I used when I was in graduate school. Um, so she literally wrote the book on the topic. She, looks, she did a lot of research on, on gender stereotypes and, and sexism and racial stereotypes and those kinds of things. And she talks about benevolent sexism as, as being different from the hostile version in that there's no ill intent behind it. There's no ill will behind it. And this is not anti-feminine. This is not anti-women. This is rather uh, beliefs and attitudes about differentiation between the sexes, sexes um, that is not hostile in nature, but yet reinforces certain stereotypes that aren't necessarily beneficial to women. Um, and I didn't have to go very far to find a benevolent sexist. I had to just look in the mirror. Because I like to think of benevolent sexism as what my parents taught me as good manners. Uh, earlier today, I was getting on the elevator, and there were three women getting on with me. And so what did I do? I held the elevator so they could get on. It's polite. Is there any reason they could not have held that elevator or managed it themselves? Of course not. When my colleagues in political science and I have a, a we have our, our graduation party the student union, and we're carrying things. If Liz Matthews grabs the heavy, I'll say, Liz, let me get that for you. She's perfectly capable of carrying that on her own. And yet, my inclination is to, to take that for her. Uh, benevolent sexism has been measured in similar to hostile sexism with a battery of questions. Here's, here's an example of what it looks like. Uh, in a disaster, women should be rescued before men. Women have a quality of purity few men possess. Women should be willing to sacrifice, men should be willing to sacrifice their own well-being in order to provide for women in their lives, and every man ought to have a woman he adores. Uh, answering yes to all four of those makes you pretty benevolently sexist. And if I were honest, I would probably say yes to number one and yes to number three. 
I, don't, I wouldn't say yes to two and four, so I guess I'm only somewhat benevolently sexist. <laughs> <laughs> but again, you know, these, uh, uh, Fisk's argument, and I think she has the data to support it, is that these arguments are tremendously widespread. And uh, not just among men, among women as well, I believe. Um, I doubt there's a whole lot of hostile sexism among women, self-hating, self-loathing, but, but this kind of stuff is pretty widespread. Um, and maybe this kind of stuff is the foundation for, or a springboard for the more uh, venal versions of sexism. I don't know. Um, one other point I would mention, it's not in the slides, but I, and I, just, I just read about it today and thought about it today. Uh, sexism is also bipartisan. Uh, there has been another powerful woman in the news lately who has been the victim of very sexist and gendered critiques, and it happens to be Kellyanne Conway. You probably saw the photo where she's sitting on her knees on a sofa, and there were some very crude and sexualized comments offered by uh, one person who was a Democratic member of the House of Representatives from, I think, Louisiana, made a reference to the Monica Lewinsky scandal in the White House, uh, a, a reference so crude and, and offensive and sexist that none other than Chelsea Clinton called him out on the spot, and he later apologized. So this kind of sexism isn't, isn't the purview of the right. There's those on the left. And, you know, it, it seems that, that in our society, men of all varieties are threatened in some way by women in seeking power or women in power. We regard them as ambitious in an undesirable way. When ambition in a man, of course, is, is, is to be uh, congratulated and encouraged. And a woman is like, no, you need to get back in the kitchen. Um, a couple concluding thoughts. Uh, and, the, and this is still in the category of things that you probably were well aware of. And I had my eyes open in the 2016 election. Um, I, I began by talking about how you know, 28, 2008 could have been, it could have easily have been the shattering of the glass ceiling as it was the breaking of the color barrier. Just that the timing didn't work out as far as Obama versus Clinton. And, that's, and so it seemed to me that we were poised as a society and ready to do either one, which would suggest that they're moving at about the same pace. I'm not sure that's the case. If you think about it, women uh, African Americans received the right to vote in this country in the 1860s, women not until 1920. Um, I think it might actually be easier for a person of color to advance in certain positions of power, including politics, than a woman these days. I think the drag of gender stereotypes and sexism might be greater than that of racism. And then the other thing that, uh, that, that struck me about this election and some of the lessons I've learned from it is that, um, you know, looking back on the, on the civil rights movement and the women's movement, to, from my vantage point, there's a certain inevitability, of, inevitability about things turning out the way they did. And, Along with that, a, 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 an assumption on my part that once battles have been won, they're won, and then you move on to the next thing. And while I would say that you, we clearly have made strides in terms of racism and sexism in this country, sexists and racists are making progress as well. And I think the most alarming thing to me uh, in the aftermath of this election is uh, viewpoints that I, in my sheltered world of the university, you know, I, I worked in a university where the, the president is a woman. At one time, my department chair, my dean, my provost, and my president were all women, and nobody batted an eye, because who cares? Why would that matter? Um, living in that sheltered environment, I'm completely unaware of the extent of, of, of really vile sexism and racism that exists. And I'm very concerned about how much it's been brought to the surface and, and in effect, normalized in the current context. Uh, viewpoints that I thought were just were, were on the fringes and, and going away. Are, are more front and center than I ever uh, had an idea. You probably knew that. I didn't know that. I know it now. 